Welcome to the Motor Carriers Insurance Education Foundation monthly truck stop webinar. Truck stops are presented the second Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. These webinars are presented as industry updates for informational purposes only and do not qualify for state CE credit. If you're seeking CE credit, contact our office. We have a number of programs that do meet the CE state CE requirements, and you can find them at our website, mcif.mcif.org. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat window. They will be answered as or responded to after the webinar by email. If you experience audio, audio problems, please send us a note in the chat window or call 800-741-484. We will attempt to correct the problems as soon as possible. Review of FMCSA proposed CSA changes. I have with me Craig Lack, who is a member of our board and uh, long and helped originally helped me found the foundation. And I, he and I are going to have a conversation about this. Yeah. Good morning, Craig. Hello, Tommy. Thanks for having me today. I look forward to going over this topic of the proposed changes. Right. I like the word proposed. We'll talk about that. And why is it proposed? I appreciate you including this slide about anybody wants to download all this mythology. Here's a place to find it and do it. This. Yeah. But we need to think a few minutes, Craig. This thing started the FAST Act. I think it was 2015, was it not? Yes. Back in 2015, uh, FMCSA had reached the conclusion that the current safety measurement system was flawed because it wasn't adequately meeting the needs of enforcement officers to identify motor carriers that had safety problems and needed interventions. So the FAST Act said, take this course off the public site. If you all remember, they disappeared, all the basic percentages, the basic alerts all disappeared overnight. And then vendors like Carrier Software recreated them and put them back in our reports. And they still get it through CAB Carrier uh, uh, Central Analysis Bureau, what the underwriters still use and you use for these things, Craig. Yeah, and and, and you also have for shippers get, get monitored by this through Carrier 401 and those things. So I was funny. They thought that that was um, taken down. It really wasn't. I, I actually was in a meeting with the deputy commissioner one time and point this out. And, and they didn't realize that it was still, the scores were still available, we never missed a stroke in those areas. But then they wanted to do this study. So they went to what, the National Academy of Science to come up with this study. That's the entity that's done what, uh, other kind of tests like SAT tests and things like that, or at least they developed that part of it. And they went on for what, a, for weeks, I mean months on this. It was actually probably more than like a year, a couple of years, they looked at using the item response theory method, which is used for like um, psychological testing and scores like Tommy said, where the item response theory is a whole different approach to predictive modeling. And I'm gonna mention this because it has some merits and it is reflected in the proposed changes here that we'll talk about today. But the item response theory method was to say, level the playing field all violations are either a zero or one and you look at the frequency of motor carriers having specific violations and you identify the outliers and those outliers are probably the ones in need of the most attention so it's a it was a pretty good system but it was a little bit complicated in their mind to roll out to the industry a little bit. I've been reading the stories about what this the article here, and, and they had the words confusing and this. I and and even to the point the motor carrier couldn't understand this. I mean, so what they've done, dumb it down part of it. But they are in a mandate, Craig. And the reason I want to point this out is that I think this is basically a done deal. I mean, they they can't sit on this thing any longer. So they've combined what they think is things to retain in the old and then overlay it with some of the thoughts of the, of the item response theory to move forward. Is, is that what, how you would categorize what these changes are? Yes, we, you know, we at Carrier Software have hundreds of truck clients. We follow the data very closely and everything going on within FMCSA. This is uh, essentially a done deal. 
there's some of the publications from FMCSA that says this will do X, Y, Z. And the fact that they're saying will implies that it's already been, you know, approved. Well, in the methodology, they even go through some scenarios that show the predictor of crashes re are reduced by some of this method versus the other part. If you read that methodology that you can download there. But anyway, so it's going to happen. And, and I'm getting a lot of discussion and from motor carriers. And of course, the underwriters need to look at it. I guess they the bottom line to the underwriters is all of a sudden they're going to have to look at something different than what they have for the last year. But it's taken them about six years to get here, though, Craig, once the report was out, they kind of rejected that part. And the discussion I had and heard and talked to Steve Bryant, you and, and Chad and uh, and these people, this this is this science. I mean, is this really going to reduce crashes? Because that's the whole purpose of it. And you said the first time around they didn't think it was reducing crashes and this i guess that's the whole thing and i don't know we can be speculative about what we do crashing now but let's go ahead and talk about what's happening here but before you go off that chart for everybody who wants to read up on what's done that reference i have here this is the best document that fmcsa has published on it so this actually does a good job explaining what the methodology is and what we're talking about today is covered mostly in that document. So of all the sources you're going to find, this is probably the best one to look at. Thanks. And that's what I just, this document is what I just quoted from, I think, Craig, because I think I downloaded, I want, I'm not the same one. So we're going to look at the new organization of the basic, in fact, it's not reorganized, you're going to throw that word out, <laughs> the basic out part yeah. of it. Uh, uh, the roadside violations, proprietary percentages, the driver fitness threshold, what's uh, what can be expected, then we'll have a kind of conclusion. So it's going to organize the basic into safety categories. This is my biggest complaint, Craig, because the basic is a behavior analysis, safety improvement categories. And as you know, when I talk, I always emphasize the word improved. And that was the whole purpose when they first published CSA 2010, when this thing first came out to prioritize the motor carrier who were having violations so they can improve before they had a crash. The old methodology tracked more crashes. And now they're taking the word improved out of that part of it, which kind of bothers me. And, and then I think we're giving the, the place attorneys more ammunition with the word safety. So now they're gonna say, you know, if the safety categories, why are you so bad in them here? I don't know how you feel about it, but that just basically uh, my overview of this. And I don't know, if I thought about going in the comment session and try to say why I take the word improve out. That's what your objective is. Yeah. And I'll get to this at the very last chart, but um, FMCSA is looking for comments on this proposed change in the safety scores. This comments are due by May 16th of 2023. So anybody who has comments, feel free to write them into FMCSA. Uh, as far as the change from basics to safety categories, I agree with you, Tommy. It's a little bit as indicating, well, they were not real successful at safety improvement, so let's change the name. Well, that might be why they changed the name, because they failed on this improvement, but I always like the idea, because I encourage retail agents to help the insurer to improve. Yeah. And of course, they're going to, the big change I find in this is, is the moving of these two categories for maintenance that's going to affect a driver part of it here. Yeah. So this is the new... We missed one. Controlled substance is going away and it's being rolled into unsafe driving. So right. for everybody's sense, your drugs and alcohol, um, any of those are all now going to be part of unsafe driving. The belief is that the issue is not the actual bottle of liquor in the cab. It's the fact that it leads to an unsafe driving behavior. That was the rationale for moving that in. And I agree that I think that's a, a good plan. Well, I think we might have that later. My my yeah. question to that: Do we have this later? I think because I got a question about that, Craig. Not on not on the controlled substance piece. Okay. Then my question is: Is it all violation or just roadside? I Meaning, it's just going to be if you fell a pre-employment, if you fell a random, if you fell a call uh, for cause, as well as the roadside uh, post-crash requirement. This, if you fell any of those, going against unsafe driving period, even though it was at the it used to be a part of the old fitness part of it uh, because you didn't you let a driver drive prior to 
uh, taking the drug test, I mean, passing the drug test. So is, is that going to all go on unsafe driving now? No, I believe that's still under driver fitness. Is it for, for but how about if they fail it, then would that be unsafe driving? Or is it just roadside uh, violations? My my understanding, I'll have to verify this, I believe it's just roadside. Which would be too far post-crash, but also if they seem impaired at the roadside yes. uh, for that part of it, and they have the breathalyzer or whatever, so that would be the two types there. Okay, that would be a question I have uh, on that because it's I didn't when I went into the listing part, I didn't realize I didn't know what it said. So this is a new category setup, right? You might explain yeah. what's happening now. So vehicle maintenance now, they've acknowledged that some vehicle maintenance issues are the responsibility of the motor carrier. There's some significant vehicle maintenance things like a cracked frame on a truck. I mean, that is the truck company's maintenance mechanics responsibility. So they split vehicle maintenance into two buckets. The vehicle maintenance one you see up here on the left, that is things that the truck company itself is responsible for. And the little arrow to the right says vehicle maintenance driver observed they are the vehicle maintenance aspects that the driver should have seen on a pre-trip inspection. They are the violations that the officer will see on a walk around level two inspection. That type of thing is cracked windshield, bald tires, um, running lamps that don't work. Yeah, this is the stuff there, DVIR, the driver. And this came up uh, and I listened to on the radio the other day, even enforcement officers, I, they took away the DVIR requirement, except when there was a violation. So I think I read that part of it, Craig. What they're saying is they're not going to put a violation of motor carry if they don't have a DVIR unless there's a maintenance problem. Now, this comes back to the maintenance if the driver could have seen it there. Now, this is going against he or she, and this is going to end up being part of the PSP program here. Yeah. And it might impair their uh, future um, uh, employment as well as now they're going to be cited for violations and motor carriers are going to know that they're doing that or not. I think this is a real good move, don't you? Yeah, this is going to really bifurcate vehicle maintenance. So the drivers will be held accountable for doing a thorough pre-trip inspection, which we at Carrier Software believe is imperative to safety improvement. The drivers need to look at their trucks before they pull out of the terminal, okay? And it also helps focus the maintenance mechanics at the depot on things that they should be responsible for checking and repairing. So it and makes sense to us that this is- Not a, only pull out of the terminal to make sure they're there, but also every time they have a, they go off the, the chain of duty where they, a part of the driving 11 or 14 and work 10 before they start the next trip, they got to do the VIR, do they not? Yes. So this is there. And so now it's getting back to who's responsible for what. Uh, I guess there's a gray area where if the DVR shows a maintenance problem and puts on the record, then it could fall back if it's not done to the motor carrier. But uh, I think they would have to show a record of that. Now, un just a, a, under the current safety measurement system, the violations are tagged as to whether or not the driver is responsible, but it gets blurred because it was all under the same vehicle maintenance category. Right. So will there will now be an alert involved in that or, or a part of the PSP? How's that going? This new category is yeah. going to happen. Do you know yet? It's not, it's not been uh, documented, but we believe they're you're going to have the opportunity to have an alert for the vehicle maintenance driver observed different than alert for vehicle maintenance other. That happens and the motor carrier will know, and the officers will know if they need to come in and do an audit to make sure that the motor carrier is making sure all the drivers are doing that inspection. That, that would be good. Now, the slide 10 is they reorganize the roadside violations. Uh, isn't a part of this because trying to get rid of the differences in various states who, who pick on certain things? Because uh, I was listening to the uh, a discussion yesterday on a, on a Zoom meeting I was on, and they and the quote is they still have not addressed the states are different, but this will help a little bit in that way, will it not, Craig? By not but by, by not drilling down to the exact violation, but just do the general categories. 
Yes, it, it, the, the number of violations, 973 there, that number has grown. I mean, back in 2010, 2011, when CSA was rolling out, I think they had like five or 600 roadside violations. The number just keeps growing and they keep adding more and more granularity when in actuality, it, it really is not a significant indicator of risk, whether it's, uh, you know, one type of lamp out or a different type of lamp out. So I think this is a good move to kind of consolidate them. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is they're grouping them into violation groups, but the individual violations still exist. There still will be 973 violations that can be cited, but when calculating these new safety scores, they're only going to be looking at the occurrences of violation groups, not the actual violations. And this is a good point to make for the underwriters because now if they just look at the alerts or the final number, which are going to be far lower than what they're used to before, but since you come back to the numerical numbers of the one and two, we'll get that in a second. They'll still need to look at the actual violations to see if they're critical or not and if they fit their profile. Like it's going to be a difference. I've, just, I've always used speeding. You speed is on your, all, all your, in the interstate highway. Or are you off the interstate highway, Craig? Yeah. You know, those are the things that, that are important um, that will still have that data. So yeah. will the plaintiff's attorneys. And by the way, so will they should be able to be fined for these, these other violations here, even though they don't go into the system itself. So this yeah. is where I find the first time that, that maybe this new system is going to have some differences in underwriting part of it, and they're going to require additional data. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah. Um, in our carrier underwriting reports that are used by, you know, thousands of underwriters right now, we actually show the current scores under the safety measurement system. We also are going to be showing the proposed new score. So we're planning to show both scores in parallel. So underwriters can begin to adapt to, okay, what are the similarities and, and differences? So yes, we need to have both scores. And the metrics really comes down to the actual roadside violations. So if you're looking at severe violations, they still exist. You can have any one of those 973 roadside violations that's severe, that could be out of service. This new proposed methodology is not eliminating the violations. What it's doing is it's just changing the math to calculate the basic percentages. And again, that that will help. That will uh, that will uh, take the uh, the um, try to level off the difference in the states, right? So that yes. instead of the states picking it up, now they're the general category here. And so this is this is a chart provided by FMCSA, is it not? Yes, this is a chart in that document. It just shows kind of the the violation groups that are proposed and. So right now, under the current safety measurement system, you had 973 violations, and they're consolidating them down. So the, the pick an easy one here, hours of service compliance. Under the current system, there's 73 violations. That's going to be distilled down into nine violation groups. And you can see the vehicle maintenance. They went from the 406 down to 15 for the vehicle maintenance attributable to the motor carrier and 35 that are driver observed. So they're, they're really- Well, that hazmat, I didn't realize hazmat made up a third of all of them. Hazmat and, 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 and vehicle maintenance, the old system is, is 800 of the 973. That, uh, you know, I, I guess there's no difference if you're maintaining the trick. The, the truck, if it's a tire problem or wheel problem, you're not doing the maintenance on the truck. And hazmat, yeah. if you don't have it placard or you have the wrong placard, uh, the idea or have the driver, that this makes a little bit of sense, does it not, Craig? Yes. The 300, the 369 hazmat violations are, many of those are subtle differences. You know, it's a hazardous with a flammable liquid. It's a hazard with a flammable gas. It's a hazard with this. It's, Every type of hazard has its own violation code, which is how we end up at 369. And then you have placarding. So it just, it just amplifies the number of violations. So I think going down to these 14 violation groups here 
will really simplify it for the people who need to look at the data and make decisions. And so they're paying attention to, to are they are they doing what's right with a hazmat main? Are they placard or not? Not what the placard says, that part yes. is, is yes. I think what you're talking about. Yes. And then the and scores become different. This is kind of interesting, this this new move where we now have one to ten and now it's just one and two. So these numbers are gonna be small, gonna be smart lower numbers, right, Craig? Yeah. This is probably perhaps the biggest change to the new methodology. In the past, all the violation points were, were violations were weighed from one to ten points, and it was a subjective assessment by FMCSA. You know, people in FMCSA thought, ooh, you know, handheld cell phone was a serious infraction, they make it a 10. If it's less serious, they make it a eight or something. And those numbers actually the the weighting within the SMS system changed periodically based on people on the inside of FMCSA. Now they're pulling in the item response theory approach here to say the violation either you have it or you don't. So all violations will be one point. That's what's in blue. So if you have the violation, it's one point. If you don't, it's zero. If the violation puts you out of service, or it is a dis driver disqualifying violation as specified in 49 CFR 383.51, that lists all the driver disqualifying violations, then it's two points. So think of everything as one point, whether you're speeding 15 mile an hour over the speed limit or six miles an hour over the speed limit, it just says you're speeding. So again, it gets back to what the purpose of this is, is so the officers can simplify the people. And I guess we, this is a good point to say, this is trying to measure a culture of safety. And as we all know, safety is not one thing you do, it's everything you do. So I think that was a basic underlying principle of the item response theory, and they're carrying some of this over this. Now, what's this going to do to the basic scores that you and I have presented and, and we've presented yeah. in other programs, Craig? Sure. The if people attended any of the uh, advanced underwriting classes in which Tommy taught, I taught, we went over how the scores work. In the past, a truck company would receive violation points for their inspections and violations. Those points would be added up times the time weights divided by a numerator, which was typically the number of relevant inspections, time weighted. So your basic measure, which is the points per inspection, roughly speaking, would be three or four or five, depending on how good or bad the truck company was. And so that's, and that's, because the, number of the, the, that's the number that was being compared with your safety event groups to see where you rank within that safety event group. Yeah. Yes. And then they, then those measures will be ranked within the safety event groups. The safety event groups, I think we'll get to it on a future chart here, aren't we, changing. We right. But what's going to happen instead of these basic measures being a value typically between one and 10, it's gonna be decimals because it's gonna be between zero and one in most cases. So the same approach works for creating safety event groups and ranking them, it's just the, the value itself will be less. Well, you still get the credit for a clean inspection, obviously then, cause that's a yes. zero. So the more zeros you got, the better off you are. And this might actually be easier for the officer because they have to put now a zero or a one, where before they left it blank if they if if they didn't have a violation. So this actually will make it make the officer more cognizant of giving a clean report, right? I mean, I've, I've never yeah. thought through that, but intuitively, I would think that would be important. Yeah, this this is this is a big improvement in our opinion. And if you go to the next chart, Tommy, I'll show you why. This shows you the 17 violations all within the driver observed lighting group. Under the current system, a driver could be cited for multiple of these. They could have three or four or five of these different lighting violations and they would get ding points for every one of those. And under the new system, it doesn't matter how many of these you have, it's just one point because you had lighting violations. 
And this will level the playing field with what has been alleged as disparate enforcement. In some states, enforcement officers are believed to be more aggressive than others. Now, the fact that you have an aggressive enforcement officer who might want to cite five lamp violations, they can cite the five lamp violations, but it only counts as one in this violation group against that driver's basic score. And also, by looking at these, it also would level the field between a drive van and a um, and a flatbed uh, yeah. part of it from the uh, cops and security tape or the lights on those things where obviously a drive van has more lights potentially out of service than you would a, a drive van. Yeah, this, this, this makes some sense. It gets back to them looking at are the motor carrier or the driver in this case observing, doing the walk around and observing everything versus, as you say, building the scores up. Uh, which then affects the uh, overall score, which affects their uh, safety event group. The other thing is we've always complained that when you move from one group to the other, then you move that and you get one more, now you're compared to a bigger group. And this is always a complaint here where a smaller motor carrier, one adverse inspection can now move them into a group where they're compared with somebody much larger than them so this is a problem. So this is a point of, they try to level the safety event groups out, correct? Yes. What this chart is I put, I put together was just a reminder. For vehicle maintenance under the current system, if you have five to 10 relevant inspections, your basic measure will be compared to everybody else with five to 10 relevant inspections. What happens is the average basic measures for people in safety event group one is a higher number than the average basic measure of people in safety event group two, and that's higher than safety event group three, four, and five. So as the safety event groups get larger, the average basic measures get smaller. What this yeah, especially means- Especially because the fleets are paying more attention to safety yep. management here for a smaller motor carrier. Uh, yep. And they got more vehicles being inspected instead of the one also that the smaller motor carrier might have. Yes. So. In our underwriting analysis, we put in a, go back up one. Okay, we have a cohort analysis that actually breaks it out by by groups and sizes and commodity types because it's really important. If a truck is in, has 10 relevant inspections and they get one more relevant inspection, they're gonna go from group one to group two. That is where their basic score could jump by five, 10, 15 points or more. And they could go from not having an alert to an alert not because that one inspection was bad, it could have been a clean inspection, but because they went to the next safety event group. So that means, right, I forgot about that. That's a clean inspection can make them jump. That's yes. because they had that inspection. Yes. Even though there's no violation. So this now, is the new one. This is the new one. This should help. I'll take it one kind of, this is the math. We I kind of try to explain it simply. What, you're, what the new methodology proposes is you take the, find the two safety event groups whose median, median number of relevant inspections bracket the motor carrier's number of relevant inspections. Then you calculate their basic percentage as if they were in each safety event group. So you're gonna calculate their basic if they were in the lower safety event group, you calculate their basic score if they were in the higher safety event group, and then you average them. So step three here, it says you calculate the average, and if the number of relevant inspections is halfway between the median for the two bracketing safety event groups, you use just the average. If it's not necessarily in the middle, but off to one side, then you use a proportionate calculation to come up with the basic percentage. And now, I love it because you dealt with a complication, but you gave me a couple examples here. So let's look at the examples, okay? Make some sense out of it, Craig, okay? <laughs> now you went through the methodology. I know you get a hang up on the methodology, but go ahead. You know, uh, we're, we're a data-driven company, Tommy, as you know. So this example has a truck company with 10 relevant inspections and vehicle maintenance. So you can see here the median number of relevant inspections in safety event group one, hypothetically, is six group two is 14. 
So their median of 10 relevant inspections puts them between groups one and two. Okay. Now in the old the current system, they would be in group one. If they got another another inspection, they would jump up to group two. The proposed method is not doing that. It's going to say you're between groups one and two. And if you go to the next chart, I have yeah. a diagram that shows how it works. With 10 relevant inspections in the top rectangle, you can see if the median for safety of event group one is six, and that's a 46% basic percentage, safety event group two to the right, median is 14, and maybe that's a 68% basic. This 10, is right in the middle between six and 14. So their basic percentage would be 57. So that's where instead of jumping from a, a 46 from the lower safety and grouped up to a 68, they're gonna fall somewhere between those two brackets. Now- And the same, same thing if they have one more, right? Go yeah. ahead. If they have 12 relevant inspections, as I showed in the lower diagram, now, the six, the 12, and the 14, the 12 is, you know, three quarters of the way towards the 14 end. So then their percentage of 63 will be three quarters of the way towards 68. So you just so take- So they'll be compared then with the yeah. rest of the people, the red group instead of the 68, they'll be compared with the 63, yes. which will should help. And so that one, well, that makes a, that, that, you believe that will help or take some of that pressure away? Yes, it's going to well, two things are going to happen here. One, it's going to eliminate big jumps in percent scores just because you picked up one more inspection. So that's a good thing. The other thing which we're going to get into here in a minute is because you're now taking the driver's relative um, relevant inspections with respect to one safety event group and comparing it to the next higher safety event group, there is a tendency that it's going to push the scores up a bit when this new thing is a new proposed me methodology is implemented. Yeah, we'll look at that part of it. But this this at least takes care. So what it's this they have to direct two criticisms. The first criticism, the states vary by by officers picking on other things where I, I use example, when you're stopped in Florida, you get 1.46, the last thing. If you dropped in California, you get 1.10. If you have in Texas, you get 1.2. If you have in North Dakota, you get less than one violation per inspection. So that's this comes back to the earlier slide where now you have the violation per inspection. And so now the smaller motor carrier will not be quite as penalized getting one more or two more inspections to move in the group. So this address those two things. I, I think uh, that's the purpose to try to address criticism because those are the ones I hear all the time. And so then the other thing is let's pick on people who are, are driving fitness more, right? <laughs> yeah. This change doesn't change the driver fitness you know, score much. The main thing they said in the uh, background information is they want to focus on truck companies where driver fitness is the biggest issue. And so by ch they change the, they're proposing to change the threshold from 80% to 90%. So now you will only get a driver fitness alert if you are over 90%, 90% or higher. So this is kind of giving a pass for some who had a, a driver fitness score of 80 or 85. Well, and then what this points out, I think, Craig, is that a few of the, mess ups about not having all the documents in the driver qualification files and things like that would not affect them as much as it does now right i mean so they're picking the ones who do yeah. more who have who don't onboard the driver enough the whole thing yeah. not just one or two little things yeah to, to be over 90 percent, you're going to have to have some serious driver fitness issues not just uh, one or two pieces of paper work missing right under the new proposed safety scores, some motor carriers will see little change in their safety scores. Other motor carriers will see a significant decrease in their safety scores, and others will see a significant increase in their safety scores. An important takeaway from this truck stop webinar brought to you by MCIEF is that you need to be aware that when this takes effect, your, your insureds, your motor carriers, 
they're all going to see a change and you want to make sure they're prepared for it. So what to expect? After uh, extensive research conducted here at Carrier Software, we were studying the proposed safety scores versus the current CSA basic scores. The reason being with hundreds of truck clients, we want to help um, mentor them into this new system so everybody knows what's coming before it happens. Using the DOT and the PIN numbers, we could actually access the current basic scores and we could access the proposed new safety scores. For motor carriers with their DOT PIN numbers, you can log on to the preview website to see what your new scores would look like. If this were that's unique case. for you because you have a lot of PIN numbers where yeah. a lot of other most agents don't have a PIN number uh, involved in unless they have those, some of the loss prevention people. So you have a great number. I think you said there's over 400 you had in here, Craig? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a big, pretty good sampling of the population. Um, the fleet sizes range from, I think, a small of five, five drivers up to five, 600 drivers. So, so, here, so here's what we found, right? Yes. So it was hard to, to distill this down for this truck stop webinar. But in essence, if you look at the horizontal axis, this shows the difference between the new proposed unsafe driving scores and the current unsafe driving scores. And the good news is, you know, 70% of them are going to be within five points of their current unsafe driving score. Now, so that, that's the good news. And that also includes the fact that under the proposed system, the control substance is rolled into these numbers. If you Which look- Which should have increased them even more than this part of it, Craig, I would think, would you? Yeah, so this, this was encouraging that it looks like most of the truck companies won't see a big jump in their unsafe driving. Uh, if you look to the right and left of that sentinel, go back up. Go back to unsafe. If you look to the right and left of the unsafe driving bar there, you can see some that are six to 10 points above and some that are like less than five points below. When you get up further, you'll see 7% of the truck companies that we, we polled here will see an increase of more than 10 points. And there's a couple here to the far right where they'll see an increase of more than 30 points in their unsafe driving score under the new system. Likewise, on the far left, some will see a decrease of more than 20 points. Just think of the, 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 um, the impact this will have for these motor carriers when this takes effect, because realize nothing has changed here. It's the same truck company, the same drivers, the same everything. And when this switch gets flipped, all of a sudden their score could potentially shift by 20 or 30 points. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Here's yeah. the hours of service is more of a shift here then. Yeah, hours of service has a similar spread. And you can, you can see, you know, 11% would see an increase greater than 10 points, 9% uh, decrease greater than 10 points. So, FMCSA has gone on record to say with this new system, their analysis indicates that no other truck company should see a change of more than 10 points. Our analysis of the actual data for our trucking clients shows something different. I mean, we have a, a good population here who's going to see a 21 to 25 point increase under hours of service when this proposed methodology takes effect. Pre-trip. Vehicle maintenance pre-trip. This is the one that is looking at the driver observed violations compared to the current vehicle maintenance basic. And you get a moderate distribution where 50, 52% of the truck companies will see really no change at all. And then it kind of spreads out from there. Again, you know, pay attention to the wings here where you're taking a vehicle maintenance basic and splitting it into the driver observe, you're gonna have you know 10% or more are gonna see significant swings when this new score becomes active. Now, if you go to the next chart, here's the vehicle maintenance other. This is the one that's more vehicle maintenance violations attributable to the motor carrier themselves. So this is really not um, 
a real good comparison because a lot of the violations that are on the current vehicle maintenance basic are attributable to the driver. But if you do the math, this is what you come up with. The vehicle maintenance other category for most motor carriers will stay the same or it will go down. It's only the bars to the right of the vehicle maintenance within five points bar that would see an increase in their vehicle maintenance other um, safe, safety group, violation group. So this one's a little bit wishy-washy, but I don't anticipate a lot of concerns around this vehicle maintenance basic. I think most of it will be on the driver observed when this gets implemented. We put in crash here just for the record. Uh, the crash basics and the crash safety scores aren't that different. Almost all the truck companies will see uh, less than a 10 point change. There's only a little bit here where they'll see a decrease more than that. So no big alarm around crash. And likewise, there's no big concern around driver fitness. As we said at the beginning of this um, webinar, driver fitness really hasn't changed much other than the threshold would be changing. Okay, so trying to summarize our, our research into these scores, this shows you what's likely to happen as far as increases, decreases. The takeaway message on this point is that tell your motor carriers to, to look into their actual scores under the proposed new methodology to see what's coming down the road so they can prepare accordingly. If they have questions about, hey, why would my proposed score look so different? They're free, feel free to contact us. We'll dig into it and go through it. We have lots of truck clients that we help with this. Craig, there's there's one thing that's that's uh, that's uh, uh, important here, and we can go to the conclusion if we want to do that part. But we're still doing the time waiting, three for three for six months, uh, two for for that, and one that. And I'm going to talk about that in a second too. That one uh, one point after that. But if they go do it now, because everybody, if our retail agents say go in motor carrier. I'll help you if you want to, but I have to have your PIN number. Look at it. And if they are having a problem, they can isolate the problem. And then if that's causing a problem, address it. And in most cases, correct it before the renewals come up, or at least making steps and progressing because of that waiting, that waiting part of it, Craig. I think that's the positive part of this, that they need to do something now because I don't think the same thing can be implemented until maybe, what, end of the year, maybe first of next year, time-wise. I know we're speculating, but... Uh, they're not going once they do the hearing they got to address all the comments and then once they're through all the comments they got to actually pass the, the final rule and publish that and give some time after that so i would imagine it'd be the first of the year would it not be before this thing would actually be in place yeah that that is our belief that this it's going to take a while for them to work through the comments make any fine tuning adjustments to it and i'm glad you brought up the time wait piece tommy because under the new proposed methodology, if you don't have, if you have a, a safety a safety category score, say for vehicle maintenance, but then you don't have any violations in vehicle maintenance for the prior 12 months, instead of the time weight going down to one, it goes to zero. Goes to zero, right. So then those vehicle maintenance will drop off your score. So that will help motor carriers um, improve their record more quickly. The, uh, and speaking about that, you haven't looked at the PSP part of this area because I think we got two areas that would affect the PSP for the driver, the pre appointment screening program, and that would be this new category for maintenance and also the drug, the, the unsafe driving part where that would be cited for those things. So I do think the drivers are going to have some additional pressure on them for their future employment with PSP. What's your thoughts about that? Yeah. Anything currently, anything that gets uh, that happens to a to a truck driver on the road, any inspections, any violations, all go to their PSP. Okay. This is going to further increase the focus on that and make PSP analysis critically important. So I would encourage again, the drivers are going to be under the under the magnifying glass and they need to pay attention to their pre-trips and make sure their trucks are in good order 
because it'll affect both the company's score as well as their own driver scores and the PSPs. And also the drug alcohol, which are two hot spots for previous employers who would not want to maybe hire that new driver because they're not doing the taking the time to do the DVRs and seconds because they had a, a, a drug violation that wasn't in the clearinghouse because they didn't actually go do a test. That was how they were cited for a violation, which is different than actually going and doing a test, is it not? Yes, yes it is. So, so if you want any questions, you can email Craig or email us MCIF uh, here because of, of time-wise and we'll answer them uh, we'll as time allows. And just remind you that uh, next month, we're gonna talk about uh, the impact of uh, of uh, the update on the drug clearinghouse and its ramifications will be the uh, the May webinar and the annual the Western Conference will have Gina to talk about this in more depth about onboarding the drivers and what's happening with all the ordinance so you can feel better about it, the marijuana mm -hmm. case. In fact, if you just rolled out the Atri, which will also be having some of that results at the Western Conference, the Atri is doing a study now about the effect of marijuana on trucking. So there's a lot of stuff going to be involved in drugs and the shortage of, of drugs and all that. With that said, Craig, thank you for your time today, my friend. Stay safe. Okay. Thank you for having me, Tommy. I enjoyed speaking to everybody, and hopefully uh, this has been beneficial. Look forward to hearing from you.